fortunate today to have with us one of the nation's most influential thinkers and writers about law and economics, Richard Epstein. Uh, this almost didn't happen. Yesterday, his flight was canceled to Omaha. He uh, scrambled around, however, and found a way to uh, get here just this morning. Uh, Professor Epstein is the Lawrence Tisch Professor of Law at NYU, an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, senior fellow at uh, Stanford's Hoover Institute, um, was and maybe still is, senior fellow at the Center for Clinical Medical Ethics at the University of Chicago's Division of Biological Sciences. I may give you some idea of the range of his thinking and abilities. Before joining the faculty at NYU, he taught law at uh, University of Southern California and later moved to the University of Chicago. Uh, before that, he received his BA at Columbia, a BA in jurisprudence from Oxford University, and then an LLB from Yale. He's an ardent advocate of minimal government regulation and simple rules. He's the author of many books. Just to name a few, Antitrust Decrees, decrees Why Less is More, Mortal Peril, our inalienable right to health care. Question mark. Question mark. Question mark, okay. <laughs> it concerns it from liberal to conservative. Right. Overdose, how excess government regulation stifles pharmaceutical innovation. Takings, private property and the power of eminent domain, cited by the U.S. Supreme Court at least four times. <laughs> Supreme neglect, how to revive constitutional protection of property rights. And uh, most recently, just this year, the classical liberal constitution, the uncertain quest for limited government. Uh, among other things, um, Professor Epstein has a connection with uh, a program we'll hold here later in the week. Uh, we will have uh, representatives both of the Prosecution and Defense Council from Guantanamo Bay. A few years ago, Epstein served on uh, the Constitution Project's Guantanamo Task Force. Uh, this is not uh, Professor Epstein's first visit to Omaha. He was here 35 years ago to speak on no-fault insurance. Uh, Professor Neumeister, who never forgets these things, uh, reminded us of this. Uh, he is, has been uh, out ill, is recovering from some major surgery. He was really sorry that he was not released yesterday, as he had hoped, in order to get to see you. Uh, today, Professor Epstein will address income inequality. Uh, data indicates there's a widening gap between the incomes and wealth accumulation of the wealthiest individuals and families in the U.S while middle and lower class incomes and asset accumulations may be more stagnant or even falling. President Obama noted this growing inequality as a problem in his 2014 uh, State of the Union speech. He promised to take action to reduce the gaps uh, by reduce, raising the minimum wage, changing tax laws, et cetera. Um, the President and some others are concerned that the widening gap means social mobility will decline, that economic growth may be stifled. Uh, today, we are privileged to have Professor Epstein's ideas on whether this is really a serious problem, and if so, what's the best prescription to cure the problem? Professor Epstein, thank, thank you for coming. people behind my back, which is extremely dangerous. No, it's a very, very great honor to be here. Yes, I do remember when I came, and this was in 1979, and I think I talked about automobile no-fault insurance, if I'm not mistaken, and the speech was published duly in the Creighton Law Review. I don't want to review that bidding there, but it was in fact actually related to today's topic. And the explanation is that it turns out that when you start with various programs that are designed to square the circle, designed to eliminate all the inequities that have existed under a previous system, what happens is you're always making yourself a bad comparison. 
You're taking a system which is battle-worn and beaten to a pulp through administration, institutional gaffes of one sort or another, and you're comparing it with a set of ideals which have yet to be put into practice. And the moment they are put into practice, what happens is they suffer exactly the same kind of ills and complexities as the system to which they're designed to replace. Uh, so that the thing that you always have to understand when you start to deal with topics of this particular sort is that you cannot, in effect, engage in what Harold Dempsey calls a nirvana fallacy. You see a very imperfect world here. You propose an alternative like nirvana, and it turns out when you try to implement it, it does not exist. And I guess, in some sense, the way the dean has set this thing up, I'm supposed to give an answer to some extent to what it was that the president um, has done. And in effect, I think it has to indulge in exactly that kind of woolly thinking. Um, I did read this morning, to my great distress, an editorial in the New York Times. Um, I read it aloud, actually, in the faculty lounge, uh, which restated the basic point. It said that we've had a very bad situation here with respect to the way in which income has declined, wealth has diminished, the gap between the rich and poor have taken place, and then it advocated the usual kinds of reforms. It wanted to have an increase in minimum wage. It wanted to have foreign treaties with strong environmental and regulatory protection, and it wanted to increase the number of unions and the power that unions have to organize. And the question that one has to ask is whether or not these are part of the problem or part of the solution. In my view, they are part of the problem. They are not part of the solution. It turns out that attitudes like this have been in control of the United States certainly for the last five years. And I think it's fair to say that the push towards a free market classical liberal system in the United States has been very weak, um, certainly since the end of the Reagan years and perhaps even during them. Uh, we have seen the decline take place on somebody else's watch. And what they propose to do is to double down on the kinds of mistakes that they've already made. So what my purpose here is to try to explain why it is that the direct pursuit of income equality is, in fact, going to be a very destructive maneuver. But I don't want to start with the particulars. I think it's really important that one goes back a bit to first principles to explain why it is that the alternative conceptions are, on balance, going to do better uh, than the ones that we have. And the sort of the initial text for this particular purpose is, I think, a very nice quip from Shimon Peres, I believe it was, who was an Israeli uh, intellectual and prime minister. And what he said was that the friends of liberty do better by equality than the friends of equality do by liberty. And what I'm trying to do is to explain why it is that that is indeed the appropriate approach. And that if you start with a liberty-centered position, what will happen is you'll develop a set of government institutions and private institutions which will be aimed at growth. Uh, the effects of that growth will be widely distributed through competition. If, in fact, you reject that proposition and try to create equality, what will happen is you'll introduce a massive system of transfer payments which will stifle growth. And, in effect, what will happen is you will have equality of the following form. Everybody will be equal and worse off than they would have been if, in fact, you allow wealth to grow and income differentials to increase. So now, how do you get to this particular position? Well, the answer is you go to the place where everything begins, and that's the state of nature. And what you're trying to do in a state of nature is to figure out what sort of legal and social institutions should be put into place in order to organize and to develop a sense of political economy. And in order to do that, what you have to recognize is what's the current legal agenda in the state of nature, what's the recipes that you have there, and what it is that you might be able to improve them. And this takes you back to a large number of debates which were involved with such people as Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, uh, David Hume, James Madison, and so forth. And this is the way in which somewhat sanitized, cleaned up, and corrected is, I think, the gist of what you learn from reading these scholars and taking their message seriously. The first thing you do is you realize that in a state of nature, the operative legal law is as follows. Everybody can do whatever he or she wants, period. Uh, there are no constraints of any sort, kind, of description that are going to be imposed upon human conduct. And in fact, to some extent, this is not a bad system. Because if you took the other system from the other extreme, which says that in a state of nature nobody could do anything, what you would discover is that everybody would quickly die and perish. So by allowing people to do exactly what they want and precisely as they please, 
at least you give people the chances uh, to acquire the kind of external support and nourishment that they need to survive, to marry, to raise families, and go to the next generation. So as between a world of complete immobility and a world of licentious freedom, we would clearly prefer the latter to the former. But the question then always is, if we prefer that to the former, does that mean that we've done as far as we can go, or whether or not there are other changes that we can make which might improve the situation further? And when you start looking at great writers like Thomas Hobbes, what they do is they come up with a very simple observation. If you look at people in the state of nature, it turns out that they have very different attributes and abilities. Some are much stronger than others, some are quite weak. But he says, no matter how strong you are, when you go to sleep, you're vulnerable. And somebody else at that particular point can find a friend or a confederate and kill you. So he says that all the natural differences that we see amongst individuals do not, in effect, give us any protection against the ceaseless dangers that come from aggression, from the use of force and the use of fraud. And what he wrote was a famous passage in States of War, Force and Fraud are the Cardinal Virtues of human behavior. Meaning, in effect, if you have no restraints whatsoever, you better be good at doing these things, because if you're not, somebody else will do them for you. And at that particular point, you think a little bit, and you say, is there any way that we could get out of this particular situation? Because somehow or other, it may be nice that we can harvest crops and raise families, but it's rather terrible if we turn around going out, killing one another. And so the great social contract that one comes in with operates in the following fashion. What we do is we get everybody together in an imaginary room, and we get them all to agree to the simple proposition that there shall be a mutual renunciation of the use of force and fraud in human relationships. Now, we're not going to tell you how we get this done, uh, but the question we're going to ask ourselves is whether or not if this particular transformation can take place from a regime of license to a regime of liberty, whether you be able to improve the overall nature of the human condition. And I think if we reflect upon it a little bit, uh, we would come to the answer that you surely can. When I wrote my book, Simple Rules for a Complex World, some years ago, I said, I'm going to give you a little thought experiment. There are two communities in which you can move. One is called Hobbesian Gardens, and the other is called Lockean Gardens. And in one of them, you play according to the rules of the state of nature. And the others, you play according to a set of rules that require the renunciation of the use of force. You can choose whichever world you want to go into. And my prediction was that Hobbesian Garden would be largely empty. Might have one person, but that won't do a lot of good. And that the other place would be heavily populated. And that's a way of showing the enormous gains that can come if, in fact, you can create this system in which everybody renounces the use of fraud and force against every person. Now, once you put it in that particular passion, what happens is you now see how the creation of a system of liberty, which is one that respects the choices that people make autonomously, but subjects them to this side constraint, has built into it a system of equality. Because what the social contract demands under these circumstances is that all individuals yield to exactly the same terms and conditions as everybody else, so that everybody has to give up the right to kill other people, which is not a worthless right, in order to achieve in exchange a right which is worth a great deal more, which is to be free of the killing from other people. But we still have this normal difficult question of how do we secure the transition. And the usual phrase that we use to describe this is called the theory of social contract. And what you have to do when you take that is what you always do when you see a great conception. Break it down into the two words and ask why it is that you can join them together in this particular fashion. Well, the first of these two words that we want to talk about is contract. And although we tend not to stress the point, we know that contracting is one of the fundamental institutions of social behavior. It doesn't matter what culture you're in. It doesn't matter what your religion is, your profession is, and so forth. To the extent that you wish to have cooperation and exchange, you could either do it by coercion, which puts you back in the state of nature, or you can do it by agreement. There are really no third alternatives to those two particular extremes. There are only blends of the two of them, certain degrees of freedom, certain degrees of sufficient, and so forth. Now, the great advantage of a system of contract in a world in which property rights are well-defined is that it leads to improvements. 
Everybody surrenders that which they value less in order to exchange for that which they value more. And if you keep the velocity of transactions extremely high, what happens is all of them create these mini Pareto improvements, as they're called, uh, so that in the end, if you can get these voluntary exchanges to move, what you will see is that the size of the pie will systematically expand. What you cannot guarantee out of this regime of equal rights is that, in effect, that everybody's slice will increase by the same amount. Some people will do better, some people will do worse. It may well be that the contracting institution raises all boats, but it doesn't raise them all at the same extent. So contract has these many desirable features because it creates a system of formal equality, which results in some economic inequalities, but it turns out that the inequalities that do arise arise from a systematic movement upward rather than from a systematic movement downward. The problem is how is do we attain this particular result? And at this particular point, one has to, I think, go forward a couple of hundred years until you get to the world of Ronald Coase, because the great achievement of Ronald Coase when he talked about transactions costs was to emphasize that fi frictions are everywhere inside a social system and that sometimes they could be overcome by voluntary agreements and sometimes they cannot. And when you start to think about the use of force and fraud, what you realize is that no set of voluntary agreements can stop that particular problem. I can enter into a contract with N minus one of you in order to make sure that none of you will kill me and I won't kill you. We all agree there's one guy outside the system and none of us could sleep well at night until we put him to rest, quite literally, under the circumstances. So that you have to have inclusion in order to create security. And that means, in effect, that the social element of the contract is as follows. We force people to enter into this kind of an arrangement. That's what makes it social. But what makes it contractual is that everybody is better off inside the system than they are outside of the system. So you create systematic forms of social improvement. And every time you start thinking about what it is that you do under this system with respect to property rights, you follow exactly the same thread. You now could look at a world in which we all agree that we will not kill and lie to one another, but we now have another prohibition that nobody's allowed to voluntarily transact with another person. And you think about that for a while, and it turns out to be absolutely crazy. So that we do is we say that your rights are not only protection against aggression by others, that's your taught in criminal law class, it also includes within it uh, the right to enter into voluntary exchanges with other individuals for your mutual gain, knowing, in effect, that if two people make an exchange in which both are better off, they set up situations with third parties, given their greater wealth, for further exchanges, bringing in more people. So that what happens is a system of formal equality, rigorously applied, tends to increase the rate of growth above and beyond that which you would be able to achieve if you only had insulation from the use of force and fraud, but nothing else going on your side. And now the question is, just how good is this idea? Well, it's a great idea. And then the next question is, they said, well, let's enter into a different kind of contract called the contract in restraint of trade, in which all the sellers in a given market agree that they will sell only certain quantities at certain prices, which today is regarded as the paradigmatic cartel formation antitrust violation. Well, it improves a lot between the individuals, but you can show by pretty elementary economic theory that the losses to the outsiders exceed the gains to the insiders. So that what happens is you now decide to limit certain kinds of contract. You do it by statute or by constitution because you can't get voluntary agreements, and you create further improvements. So essentially what the classical liberal program is, at least in terms of substantive rights, is any time you see yourself in a given position, you ask yourself, can we make two kinds of improvements, one by voluntary agreement, and then we have to check that their external effects aren't negative, large enough to offset the gains. And then you start to see whether or not there's some collective improvement that could be created, but transactions cost means you have to do it by legislation or by statute. And so what you're constantly trying to do in this game is grow that pie, grow that pie, grow that pie. Now you need institutions to make sure that this thing is going to work. And these are not the easiest thing in the world to come by. If you go back to our friend Sir Thomas Hobbes, his attitude was all individuals by social contract will agree to throw themselves abjectly on the altar of some all-powerful sovereign because that's the only way in which they could protect themselves against the evil of other individuals. 
to which the answer comes back, we can know some sovereigns who would be far more dangerous because of their monopoly of power than any private person can be. And what we then do is develop our own system of government, the great tradition of Hobbes and Locke and Madison, separation of powers, federalism, vested constitutional rights, the whole ball of wax, what's it about? It's about the effort to make sure that when you put institutions in place, which are designed to preserve this cycle of voluntary and coerced improvements, that is through the prohibition on force, the prohibition on restraints in trade and so forth, the institutions that you put in place to enforce these norms do not become so big that they essentially consume them. And the program, therefore, has to work with respect to formal equality, because the moment you start making exceptions for your friends, everything starts to go very bad indeed. It has to use a large measure of coercion in order for it to succeed. And you need a non-discrimination principle, which means that you as the government cannot play favorites. So if you start with a system of liberty, you must necessarily include a system of equality if, in fact, you're going to be able to make all the adjustments from simple private transactions to a well-ordered, well-run government state. And by the way, this is not a particularly small state. It's not as big as the monster that we have today, but I think it would be very unlikely that you could construct the state which would allow you, for example, to consume something less than 20% of the GDP on internal governance and external protection. Um, so you're talking hundreds of billions of dollars in the modern economy for what I call, in my book, the classical liberal constitution. Now, the question is, how do we compare this with respect to the modern programs that are taking place? And I think it's sort of nice to go back to that list with respect to the New York Times on the kinds of improvements that they regard as intelligent ways to respond to the particular problems that we've seen in recent years, namely increased minimum wage laws, very tough environmental protection and trade laws on the one hand, and all sorts of unionization on the other and see the way in which this thing starts to play out. Well, at this particular point, it's quite clear that the dominant text that you're talking about is the text of equality. And the question then is, is there any place for liberty in a system which treats equality as its final goal? Well, if you're stressing equality of rights, then in effect you can say all people are born with their creator with the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so you're right back to the libertarian position, starting at the other side with the equality dimension and protecting the liberty dimension as you go along. So it's clear that when the moderns talk about this, they're not talking about equality in that sense. They're talking about equality of income, equality of wealth, which of course is exactly the same text that the president speaks from, that the Democratic Party speaks from, and that its favorite mouthpiece, the New York Times, speaks from as well. But you have to understand that this is a very different set of consequences and a very different kind of socialization organization that you're trying to put together. Now, the first point to note in all of these particular cases is that each of the three things that I've talked about in their own way are designed to limit the way in which voluntary transactions start to take place between adults and ordinary individuals. And generally speaking, you would want to apply to the provisions that they have exactly the same test that you applied when you explained why it was that the antitrust laws are perfectly appropriate to place limits on those voluntary contracts, which to use the common law phrase, are in restraint of trade. And if you go through these various things, all of a sudden you'll start to see that they have exactly the opposite intentions and the exactly the opposite results of the one that we're talking about. And so if you start with a minimum wage law, what it says in effect is if you wish to enter into a certain kind of contract with a given kind of worker, you must pay him so much per hour in order for this job to take place. Now the question is who are you protecting when you engage in this kind of a legal attitude? And well, the first thing, obviously, that one would want to say is that what you're doing is you're protecting the individuals who would otherwise take an income for less. The difficulty, of course, is that there is no obligation on the employer under a minimum wage law to hire people at a wage that makes no sense from him. And so while you will protect those lawyer workers who do manage to get jobs at the higher number, there will at least be some workers if the minimum wage laws to have any pop at all who will get no jobs at all. 
So at that particular point, you're now faced with this very embarrassing trade-off. Do you think that the increase of the wages of some is worth the increase of unemployment for the others? There was a recent report coming out of the White House um, which announced that the proposed living wage, moving the, up to $10.10 an hour, would in fact create benefits for 16.5 million people. And how could you possibly resist a statute like that? Well, the way in which you resist it is to examine its consequences, it seems to me. And the first thing you have to do is to ask yourself, what is the size of the gains of all the individuals who are going to go up to $10.10? Well, that depends on what their wages were before. But it is perfectly consistent with the president's proposition that you had 15.5 million people earning $10 an hour, each of whom gets a 10 cent increase in wages. But the question is, what's the downside? And it turns out that there are going to be some people who are much lower than that on the totem pole, say at the $7.25 figure we're talking about. And it's going to be highly unlikely that all of them will be, continue to be employed if, in fact, an employer has to give them close to a 50% increase in real wages. So some of these people are going to start to go down to zero. You then have to net out very large losses for a small group against much smaller gains for a larger group. And the number that you come up with in an economy of about $16 billion, trillion dollars rather, is that you may be able to improve by this particular measure about $2, million, $2 billion in gain, which works out to about $120 per person um, on net. But that's a transfer payment. You also have to take into account that those $2 billion are coming from somebody else. That's going to be an employer. If what you're trying to do is to figure out the social consequences, it is simply a wrong form of accounting to look at only the winners from regulation and to ignore all the systematic losers from regulation, which include those individuals who have to pay the premium on the one hand and those individuals who are shut out of the labor market at all. So if you go through the complete analysis, this is the kind of restriction which looks to be systematically negative sum. Uh, that is, if you figure out all things taken into account, you're spending a very heavy fortune to implement the system, which when it is implemented will result in a smaller overall product than you would have had without it. And the thought that somehow or other you can shrink the pie in ways that will prove greater income equality turns out to be wrong as well. Because remember, some of these people are wiped out completely so that if you look at the class of individuals below $10 per hour in wages, there's huge income inequalities that is generated by the imposition of this system and huge social distortions that take place by reducing the opportunities that employers have to invest in people. Great incentive now to either cut back on the total size of your enterprise, to send some of it overseas, to substitute in automatic equipment for labor under a whole variety of contracts one way or the other. So the proposal itself cannot work. But we're told, in effect, that, you know, why are you worried about the minimum wage? Everybody agrees that there's regulation. I gave you the illustration, for example, of the restraint of trade law. And certainly anybody who teaches contracts will know there's things like the statute of frauds and the parole evidence rule and the statute of limitations, which are all forms of regulation on private contracts. But again, do the test. When you put the statutes in place under the statute of frauds, you're increasing the security of transactions. You're not telling people what they can sell things for. So those are positive sum statutes. And therefore, the mere fact that there's regulation doesn't mean that you commit yourself to all regulation. It means that you only commit yourself to that regulation which, when systematically and uniformly applied, will overall expand the pond. And so the first of these devices does exactly the opposite. We had a minimum wage increase in 2005, 2007. Uh, the most conspicuous concept of that was a very sharp increase in unemployment rates uh, for minority kids who essentially now have an unemployment level of around 40 percent, of 10 percent from what it was before these things were happening. So why somebody would want to do this under the name of equality is, in fact, to me a mystery. Then what we do is we start talking about various other kinds of regulations dealing with protection and environment. Well, one of the great challenges on the economic front in the sort of international areas is as follows. If you understand, as we should understand, that international trade is just another set of contracts which produces gains to both parties, 
If these gains are generated in competitive markets, they will generate further opportunities for people to trade with the people who have traded with one another so that you'll be able to expand the pot. The great challenge in international affairs, therefore, is to find a way to keep free trade alive in a system which will allow these particular gains from trade to exist not only nationally, but internationally. And the moment you decide, in effect, that you're going to stop this by a tariff or by a prohibition or a tax of one kind or another, what you're doing is you're taking profitable transactions in a market context and preventing them from happening, which means that the gains disappear. This will create losses on the American side, and of equal importance, it will create losses for people in other countries who are denied access to our markets in an effort to improve their own welfare and their own jobs. It is striking that you have a universalistic uh, egalitarian position, which whenever you get to a domestic situation, treats the losses of foreign individuals, many of whom are in desperate straits, as just one of those incidental things that we don't worry about, never is a serious kind of social concern for us to take into account. So that what happens is in our effort to preserve equality at home on an economic front, we are willing systematically to stoke the flames of inequality and intolerance with respect to the way in which we start to deal with people overseas. And if you're really serious about what a well-run society looks like, you cannot just take a nationalist, jingoist perspective. You have to take an international perspective at all and understand that a tariff is an interference with prospective advantage, not justified by any of the standard things which would allow you to do it in a domestic market. So this is a terrible mistake. When it comes to the environmental issues, it's much more complicated because even within a framework of laissez-faire, the use of pollution in order to advance yourself constitutes the tort of nuisance, which somebody is allowed to enjoin or to recover damages for when, as and if, it should occur. And if you have pollution in the international context in which they're doing something to you, a tort remedy is every bit as appropriate. But that's not what people are worried about in this particular case. If you look at any domestic economy, what you discover almost uniformly is that the willingness to invest in public goods depends very much on the private level of prosperity of the individuals within that economy. So if income levels are extremely well, low, uh, it turns out that people who live in hovels are not particularly appalled about the fact that their streets are rutted with potholes and that there's all sorts of waste and filth going out there. Better the filth be in the street than in the house. But the moment you start to raise the level at which people can live by virtue of allowing them to earn, what happens is they want their public spaces to improve so they match in quality the private spaces. So as they start to have sanitary houses, they want to have clean streets as well. So if you increase the prosperity that starts to take place in other nations, the environmental risk that they have for themselves essentially will take care of themselves. Or to put it in its bluntest terms, the control of pollution is to some sense a necessity of life, but in another sense, it is simply an indulgence that the, risk have, the rich have for themselves. Now, how do you do this? Well, if you start to tell people in another nation we don't like the way in which you're polluting your own waters. What you're telling them, in effect, is that they have to make expenditures on public items which, given their current wealth levels, are not indicated. They have to live by our standards, not by their standards. So if you also say, we won't trade with a nation unless they pay its work as X dollars per hour, and the wage there is a quarter of X, that minimum wage law is much more devastating than if you impose the same numbers on your own workforce where people are already at 90% of the wage level. So the wage restrictions that you want is a condition of free trade, and the environmental restrictions that you want other nations to impose upon themselves are simply protectionist devices to make sure uh, that goods and services that come from overseas will be crippled so that they won't compete with those which are made at home. There is, of course, at home always an alliance of large firms and large labor unions that staff those firms to make sure that you keep these kinds of goods out. And when somebody like the New York Times starts to endorse an increase of this particular program, what they are doing, in effect, is cutting off from America the kinds of goods and services that could make us more powerful. And they are doing this in a way which makes the countries with which we would otherwise do business poorer and less self-sufficient than they would otherwise be. Why this advances the cause of equality in a sense that we ought to be proud is a mystery to me. <laughs>
So we take the third of our particular elements in here, which is strong unionization in the United States. And one has to understand the way in which labor unions operate. They have a whole variety of problems because what they try to do is to organize a group of workers in a way that they have sufficient market power as against an employer or against an industry filled with lots of employers so they, in effect, can get monopoly wages. Or to put it otherwise, the function of a union is, in fact, to act in restraint of trade. So the very kinds of rules that you would condemn in businesses, as we talked about earlier, connection with monopolies, are now given a free pass with respect to workers. This was not always the case. In fact, if you go back before the First World War, labor organizations were subject to the same kinds of antitrust laws as were business organizations. And so collective refusals to deal by way of a secondary boycott were per se violations of the Sherman Act. You get to 1914 and the Clayton Act passes and all of a sudden you see a new disjunction take place. In Section 7, what we do is we tighten the restrictions on businesses that attempt to merge and in fact may well cut out certain merges that make sense, but at the same time we give agriculture and labor a complete exemption from the antitrust laws so that they could organize as they will. That in turn does not quite protect them because employers can still say no and go to unorganized workers for their jobs. And so workers then desperately, who are in unions that is, seek to find ways to prevent that competition from taking place. If you look at some of the cases in the 1920s, like the Coronado coal cases, what you see is in effect unions shutting down by force non-union coal mines in order to preserve the price of their own goods. And they don't have to do this after a while under the National Labor Relations Act because the United States government will take their place. So what happens when you put these into place is you now get yourself a situation where you have the government supporting cartel operations by workers. These workers have to exclude outsiders, which they effectively do. If you go back and you look at the legislative history of the Davis-Bacon Act from 1931, this is a Republican convention, uh, the whole point of paying high wages to unionize workers in the South in the North, rather, was to prevent quote-unquote colored workers from the South coming up North and taking away our particular jobs. There could be no more evidence of protectionism than that. Unions have always worked in this particular fashion. There's nothing particularly romantic about them when done on an industry level. If it's a question of having a company union organized by the firm so as to improve work relationships, most firms are very amenable to that, but it is not an accident that under Section 882 of the National Labor Relations Act, those kinds of plant-wide unions are banned. And the reason they're banned is that they operate in competition with industry-wide unions. They have much less of a cartel threat. And so therefore, they cannot be tolerated if you wish to organize first. We've been very lucky in the United States to the extent that the Labor Party has never taken over the Democratic Party the way in which this happened in England and in New Zealand. Uh, within a 50 or 70 years after their introduction and their dominance, both countries go from essentially being titans of industry and high wealth standards to being on the verge of bankruptcy. Uh, it was reversed a little bit in England by Margaret Thatcher in 1980 and in New Zealand by Sir Roger Douglas around 1986. But the unmistakable trend is that collective bargaining cannot increase the overall wage levels within a society. It will make short-term improvements for union workers, but in the long run, the destruction of production will more than offset those gains. In the short run, those people who are excluded from the unions, which must keep its membership limited if they're to raise wages, raise wages in effect shows that you have both short and long-term losses. So what is it that happens under this system? It turns out that when you take all of these great devices, you get gains for some and losses for others. And the great difference between the progressive system of today and the other system is really very simple. Every form of regulation that I'm talking about is trying to grow the pie, and it treats redistribution as an unimportant issue. Their view is they don't care whether they grow the pie or not. They think of income equality as being the dominant issue. And what do you get? You do not get income inequality because these systems have, as I've meant to you, very many unintended effects. It certainly means that you don't get the growth of capital. And what you get is exactly what I predicted would happen in 2008 when I wrote about the Obama stuff, is we still have some technological innovation, 
although the President's doing his best to kill that as well with patent reform and so forth. But the long-term tend is slowly downward because we have put ourselves into a position whereby thinking that equality comes first by way of income, what we have done is systematically neglected the importance of growth, which in the long run is far more the important effect. So what is it that you can say about this? Well, when I gave a little interview on PBS, which provoked, to put it mildly, both positive and negative reactions, I ended with a quote that I thought came from Abraham Lincoln, which said, in effect, uh, that you cannot make the poor rich by making the rich poor. And what he really meant is that system of transfer payments never achieve their intended objective. Now, it wasn't Lincoln who said this. It was one of the collectors of his various aphorisms. But it was, in fact, a message that Lincoln himself actually believed in when he did his own work. And I think, in fact, it is exactly correct. There is a very easy way to reduce income inequality. That's to make the rich poor. And if you measure the success of society by tumming up the differences in wealth amongst all individuals, then income inequality at a level of zero wealth for everybody has zero inequality. It would be the perfect society. Well, nobody actually believes that. So if you want to go in the opposite direction, you should. And then what's it going to do with respect to inequality? And here, two things will happen, and I'll end on this note. One is if you really do expand the size of the pie, the people who are at the bottom won't be in desperate straits. So it's not going to be a situation where 10% of your population is below the subsistence level, and either they get some kind of support or they perish. It's not going to be a question if two is the subsistence level of some having one and others having 10. It's now a system of some having 10 and others having 100. So the need in order to have redistribution to prevent death is in fact destroyed by wealth. And one ought never to forget that particular kind of element. And secondly, when you start to expand these particular pies and you do come up with this sort of inequality and some people who are left behind, the greater wealth has the following desirable consequence. The people who have massive amounts of wealth are now in a position to give large amounts of it away to help those people who are in need. Now, there's nothing to compel them from that. And in fact, they can, if they choose, reject the proposition that there is diminishing marginal utility to wealth so that the dollar to the rich man can actually be worth much more than the dollar to the poor man. Problem is nobody believes that. Even I don't believe that. And so what happens when you start to get accumulations of wealth is you get accumulations of various forms of charitable support. Maybe not for individuals in all cases, but certainly through institutions that help individuals. So if you go back to the height of laissez-faire, what I ask everybody to do is to reflect on who founded the various universities in the United States. Leland Stanford was not some random person. He was, in fact, a baron, a magnate, a robber baron, if you wish. His son dies, and Stanford University is formed in honor of his death. Johns Hopkins was a real person. Mr. Barnard organized Columbia, rather, Barnard College was a real person. Mr. Yale, by the way, was a person, and Mr. Harvard was a real person as well. What happens is, when you start getting these obscene levels of wealth, you become very obsessed about it, and you try to find out ways to give some of it away intelligently. Now, Bill Gates probably created more in human satisfactions by creating a system of computers that actually worked, but I can assure you he cannot figure out how on a daily basis through the purchase and consumption of fine wines to spend the $6 billion a year that he happens to earn. So what he does is he spreads the wealth around amongst others. And if you really want to have the situation in which there's going to be wealth spreading, you want lots of rich people because the patterns that you get with respect to cons consumption are completely different from the patterns that you get with respect to income. So our current system discourages those formations, tries to make things work out by heavy taxation and restrictive legislation, and what you've seen is a very slow and consistent decline. If you double down on the current policies, you will simply double down on the current trends. It's time to stop, rethink, and start over. Thank you. Look, I mean, I can't give a talk like this and not take questions. So let me ask the first question. No, there's, there's somebody has to have a question. Come on. Oh, thank God. Name? 
My name is Hassan Sheikh. I'm the state chair for Young Americans for Liberty. I know that, and you're the guy who's, oh my, look at that. Look at this guy's dress. He's got a vest on. I love it. All right, Hakim, go shoot. Uh, well, first of all, I wanted to thank you so much for coming, especially despite the difficulties. We, uh, not everybody here knows this, but Professor Epstein's uh, flight last night was canceled. So we actually booked another one, spent the evening in Detroit, a wonderful city. <laughs> and, uh, Watch the Oscars. And then came here this morning just so that he could uh, come to this lecture. Which okay. We deeply appreciate. Well, that's uh, the question. My question is: uh, a lot of these measures that we're talking about seem to fall into the place of non-discriminatory clauses that any liberal government, uh, you said, would be important. So, is this not the type of non-discrimination a, a country should should strive for to create some inequality? Okay, let me. The, the, the question. I'm going to rephrase it a little bit. Is you notice that I emphasized here non-discrimination. And the question you're asking is how far do you push this particular idea? And it turns out this is actually a very deep question. And if you're dealing with competitive markets in which individuals have lots of choices on lots of sides, your views is to let anybody discriminate any way that he or she wants with respect to anybody that he wants to do business with or she wants to do business with. Because if you get too far out of line, somebody else will step up and offer a substitute product. So to give a famous story by my former colleague, Frank Easterbrook, um, he comes in and he says, when he was in practice, some client comes up to him and he says, there's got to be an antitrust violation here. He says, every time I raise my prices, I lose my customers. And every time I lower my prices, I can't make any money. And so Frank looks at him and says, congratulations, you're in a competitive industry. Because that, that's exactly what happens. It's only when you have monopoly rents that you have the power to raise prices and not lose all your customers. So in this world, let people do whatever they want. Because one of the theorems is, is that you can't price discriminate when there's pure competition. But you will observe different prices. And that's because when you start looking at the cost of service, it's different to different individuals in various markets. And so if you try to say, I want uniform prices for uniform situations, you're creating massive cross-subsidy. So to take a market which has failed on this, the individual healthcare market in places like New York and Washington, DC, they say, doesn't matter whether you're a dean or you are getting insurance, you're all people, we'll charge you the same rates. Now, for countries like us, uh, the rates are about, in terms of cost, four times or five times what they offer the likes of you. We charge equal rates, right? And we're running as fast as we can to get that coverage, and you're running in the opposite direction. So that's a classic situation where you're now requiring non-discrimination, but in fact, you're trying to ignore cost differentials. And the correct way to form the economic proposition is to say that you will get a uniform rate of return on your investment in a competitive market, whether you're insuring the healthy or the sick. But if you impose a, quote, non-discrimination rule on the actual provider, you drive the market into oblivion. Now, when you start talking about government, you're talking about monopoly. And monopolies are different because they have price discretion. So this first came up in connection with common carriers. And the issue is, can I charge discriminatory rates to all the customers I've had? And the answer is complicated. There are two parts to it. Suppose it turns out that there's some of my customers who I'm going to have to serve during the day when there's a peak load demand, and there are others at night when the demand is much lower. If I have to charge the two exactly the same price, and the cost is high on one end and low on the other end, it's just the same problem that you have in a competitive market, which is subject to restrictions. You get big cross subsidies. It doesn't work. So what you want to do, in effect, is to say that people can always have cost-justified discrimination, even in monopolies, because you're trying to stop the cross subsidies that kill markets. But on the other hand, if the two of us are in identical positions in the market and present the same cost, if we allow the utility to say, I'm going to serve you, but not to serve you, I serve women, I don't serve men, I serve whites, I don't serve blacks, at that point, there's a real danger. So essentially, the anti-discrimination norm, as applied to monopoly institutions, is designed to prevent illicit wealth transfers unrelated to the cost of providing real services. Now, government is a monopolist, right? And either you have an anti-discrimination norm that limits what it can do, or it will do exactly the same thing that the unscrupulous operator will do. And if this government has a racial animus of one kind or another, you can get the kind of situation that you had under segregation in the South, 
under apartheid and so forth. So when you have a monopoly power, you have a duty to serve, and you have to serve on non-discriminatory rates. And this was understood in the economic area at the various latest by about 1810 in a case called All Nut and Inglis, and it's got to be carried over to the political stuff. And sure enough, when you see monopoly comes up, say, in interstate commerce, and local governments want to tax foreign guys coming in but not their domestic people, they got a monopoly. And so what you do is you introduce a non-discrimination rule so they can't play favorites. And essentially one of the great achievements of the American Constitution through judicial interpretation has been to create a free market nationwide by using the non-discrimination principle as the first rule with respect to interstate taxation. So it turns out discrimination is wonderful in one place and deadly in another. And you have to understand the theory of monopoly power to understand where it should be used and where not. It's easy to say we don't regulate competitive markets. It turns out all monopoly markets differ from one another in significant <coughs> ways. And it's very difficult to come up with the ideal system of rate regulation, a topic about which I've written a lot and I understand only so much. I don't understand everything. <laughs> Nobody does. OK, OK. Another question, please? Somebody? Yes, you've got a copy of my book. Two of them. Yes, sir. Would you say something ab about the, the history of child labor yeah. in the early part of the 20th century as an example of the wealth effect? Oh, sure. I mean, it's not only the early part of the 20th century. It goes back a lot further than that. There is a very powerful book written by a man named Benjamin Powell, which goes through all the various child labor statutes. I'll give you his conclusion, then I'll tell you how it gets there. He says, when you put child labor laws into effect, what essentially is you're saying to parents that they cannot send their child into a market uh, for what they regard as a beneficial transaction, either for the child or for the family. Well, if they can't send them into a market, they've got to do something. And so what you do is you can document a systematic increase in begging, prostitution, maiming children, all sorts of other things, by virtue of the fact that a unit of production is no longer available. So how does this start to play out? Well, if you go back to, say, 1800, and you're trying to figure about the use of child labor, it is endemic everywhere throughout the world because 90% of the economy is a farm economy, and there is no employer around to exploit the children. They're just parents, to quote unquote, exploit the children. And either they contributed at a very early age to the production from the farm, or there isn't enough food to go around. And for those of you who don't know it, agriculture, even today, is one of the most dangerous forms of occupation in which you can enter. And it was much more so back then. Between the sunstroke on the one hand, the parasites that existed in the soil on the other, to the dangerous equipment that you were using, to the kinds of infections that you could get from animals, on and on it goes. It was very rough. And in fact, throughout the world, when agriculture was the dominant form, it turned out life expectancy did not increase for a period of about 300 years from 1550 or so to 1800. In a place like England, it was stuck at 40 years per age, much of it death in childbirth or childhood, much of it because of chronic conditions that killed people. Now, when you move to an industrial society, right, what happens is now you have somebody known as an employer. And the employer, in principle, can now be a subject with respect to regulation. And what happens is you see a systematic move, slow at first and then gaining in speed, of people going from the country to the city to work in these jobs. And what you do is you observe a very high accident rates with respect to many of the firms which hire these workers. What you don't observe is the accident rates in the city are lower than those of the accident rates on the farms. And so what you do is you're seeing a social improvement coupled with enormous reforms to stop all this stuff from taking place. And then lo and behold, you look at the aggregate data, and by 1900, life expectancy in England is from 40 to 47. And all the statisticians saying it can't possibly last because we've been mired in this rut for so long. But in fact, it was the ability to get away from the farm and go into industry. And then it's a competitive industry. And after a while, you start bidding for workers on grounds of safety as well as on grounds of wages. And kind of everything starts to increase. You put the child labor laws into place. They don't help anything. 
unless you think that parents are engaged in the systematic exploitation of their children for their own use. And for that, the appropriate remedies are laws of abuse and neglect, which cover only a very small fraction of these cases. In most of the situations, these were perfectly rational decisions in which you had team production by the parents and by the children, where parents, at the same time they sent their children to work, would still subsidize their labor uh, by virtue of all they did for themselves. And so you see all these improvements taking place, and the reformists start to come. And what happens is where they indicate and they succeed, you see exactly what Powell referred to. You're disrupting an efficient ecosystem and putting an inefficient one in its place. This then, in turn, starts to lead to all sorts of battles. And I'll just mention one of them here, which is the great case of Hammer versus Dagenhardt from 1918. And the question was, when the state of North Carolina has a 12-year minimum age law, and the federal government has a 14-year wage law, can the federal government impose its law on the state by saying that if you make goods in your factories, whether or not those goods use child labor and wish to send them into interstate commerce, we're going to ban them if you have any child labor at any point in your enterprise. And uh, John W. Davis, who later argued uh, Brown v. Board for the South, came up with the argument that there was a huge prisoner's dilemma game here because he said every state will, in fact, lower their laws. What he never explained was whether the dilemma was a good or a bad thing. And it turns out it was a good thing. So what happens is if you take that little book you have there and hold it up, how progressives rewrote the Constitution, the first part of it starts talking about what happens when you look at the number of child labor situations and problems you have. And child labor starts to recede mightily between the years 1900 and 1930 as family income starts to increase because of greater overall prosperity. And uh, there is a child labor amendment movement which goes. It gets adopted, I think, in four states. But by 1935, it's dead. And why is that? It's not because the regulations stamped out child labor. It's because the economic growth made it essentially unnecessary. And so one of the great virtues that the 19th century advocates of laissez-faire preached was patience. What they meant by that is it may look bad now, but if you try to intervene for short-term gains, the long-term disruptions will end up killing the very goals that you wish to achieve. So back off. The situation will get better because of the market forces that will improve it. And they were right. They weren't wrong. It was the indignant reformers like Charles Dickens who was always wrong on these particular questions. And it was only after you started to see the trend on child labor and generally on industrial organization shift in favor of government regulation that starting in the 1880s in England, you start to see the level of growth of the country starting to go down. And by 1906, with the Trade Disputes Act, which essentially insulated unions from all kinds of government oversight and regulation, that it really starts to become very steep punctuated, of course, by two wars where somehow or other labor disputes seem to be less important than dealing with Adolf Hitler. All right, is there room for one more question? Or do you want to just end? I think we're at, we're at the time. We're All right, that's okay. Well, thank you all for coming.